Hey guys, it's Adam from Miss Pixel, and I am very excited to talk about this book today. Not review it. If it was a review, I'd let you know if I liked it or not at the end of the video. I love this. I love all of these books. That's why I bought them. So I want to talk about them because in here aren't only some of the most inspiring works of art that I've ever known. Um, if you've watched my channel for any length of time, my, my artwork is, a, is, a, is an homage to how this work inspires me. Um, but there are such valuable lessons to us artists. And the first lesson that I think these books do, and if you tie it into the review I did of the Game of Thrones art book that I reviewed recently, which you can check out right here, um, it teaches you that not all professional art is a single recipe. There are many different ways of approaching the idea of professionalism. It's a chemistry, it's a relationship between, between director and artist, and that big global vision and the type of director that they are, the type of production that it is, that will allow or disallow certain types of expression. So this, what I wanna talk about today ties into all the different souls. Books, games, Bloodborne, Dark Souls, Sekiro, Elden Ring, etc. This ties into all of them because the design philosophy with all of these different games is very, very similar, despite the different genre that it might be. So let's crack it open. Right out of the gate, one of the first things you're gonna notice looking at the first few pages is there's a lot of high contrast artwork. Now from a professional perspective, if you've ever watched any of my, um, uh, not mine, but if you've, ever, if you've ever watched any of the Brush Sauce Theater art contests with me, Tyler and Jessica, um, which I'll link below by the way, um, one of the comments, one of the critiques we make of, of more novice artists is learn to use values properly. And if, an, if a beginner artist walks in and sees something like this and tries to recreate this style of art or use this as, uses this as an example of how to create art, they're gonna be going down the wrong path real quick. But in this particular case, the artists already have a very solid fundamental knowledge and what they're trying to aim to create, and I'm not making excuses for them, I can see it. What the artists are trying to create is a mood. They're trying to capture the feeling, this lonely, dark feeling that they're only starting to explore in this first rendition of Dark Souls. They're trying to create this world in this ambience that pulls players into this little world of theirs. And as we move forward, you can see there's a lot of different, there's a lot of experimentation in here. How they render out different things, the approaches, the brushes that they use. Some are a little bit more polished and refined. Some use big bold brushes. Some are very sketchy. Some are very polished and very monochromatic. Some are very detailed and overlaid, some aren't. Some are done with a lot of line art. And what you start to realize is two things. One is that Miyazaki clearly allowed artists to express with whichever voice they had. I can see this as an artist, I can see this as a director. He set the tone and he said, I want you to achieve this feeling. And he allowed artists to do it in their own unique way, which I love because very often when you're working in studios, due to technical restraints or due to you know having directors that might be a little bit a little bit more practical a little bit less risk takery they might put so many artistic constraints on the artist that it kind of puts a bit of a stranglehold on them and holds them back from being able to express themselves and that's why very often artists will find themselves hired for certain studios and then find that as time passes they have a very hard time adapting to the work ethic of that studio and i found myself in that situation several times myself but the other thing we see here is that as we flip through these images, although they're very different, I recognize every one of these locations. So Miyazaki, as much as he allowed artists to explore these different locales and these different styles, he had no hesitation translating this information directly into the finished piece. But one of the things that makes me respect Miyazaki so much, and I really mean this, is that he told the artist to just express Look at the detail. Look if we close, if we come a little closer. Look at the incredible detail that we can see in this creature. As we move through in the wings, we move to the tail. Look at the beautiful, heavy level of detail that we have in this. And then realize that this translated into the finished product. So what he probably did is he told the artist to create something artistically powerful, detailed, rich, immersive, moody and then gave that drawing to the 3D guy and said, model that. 
And the 3D guy said, what? And he said, yes, please model this. And he goes, but that's pretty freaking, that's gonna be one weighty model. <laughs> and he said, that's fine, please model this. To him, art came first and technicality came second. He, he didn't restrict himself or his artists on their ability to express, of course, our fair lady, uh, to express themselves artistically and wanted that artistic vision to translate directly into the finished product. That is seldom happens. I can literally put myself in these locations because I know them, I've been in them, I've played these locations. And you realize that you're literally playing a painting. And when we get into the Dark Souls, when we get into Dark Souls 3, that whole premise, the painting, the artistic creation that is this world, becomes a part of the narrative. It was such a beautiful summary of the Souls series, although that we might very well have sequels, I sincerely hope. Um, this translates directly to the player. You're in essence playing a work of art. So there's my first love. And then we have part two. Now, when we get into the second book, into Dark Souls 2, which a lot of players said, oh, it's the shittiest Dark Souls of all time. I disagree. I, I wasn't my, it wasn't my favorite Dark Souls the first time I played, but it grew on me. And it's actually turned out to be one of my personal favorites. But look at how you can see the artists have evolved and they've, they've started to add a little bit more expertise. And they're expressing their artistic chops with a little bit more skill. But now they have the freedom to do this because they've already had the time to really flesh out this world. So they're starting to really understand this world. They're really starting to grasp the the design aesthetic and the mood aesthetic of this game. And we're starting to get things that are a lot more evocative and a lot more artistically powerful. Another thing that I find very powerful in this piece is, for instance, from a design perspective, if you look at this, if you look at this over here, notice how the emphasis from an artistic perspective is placed in this area of high contrast over here. Yet we have a figure that's hidden in the dark. And this is uh, something else that I love. We can appreciate the decay and the age of this, but the insignificance of this beautiful sculpture. And it's the insignificance that really translates into the whole narrative of Dark Souls, the insignificance of life, the lost beauty and history of humanity, which is so relatable. One of the reasons why relics and ancient relics and, and locations are so precious to us. But how sad it is that all of this craft and all of this effort can be lost. This beauty can be lost in the shadow. And that to me is far more powerful than having a beautiful bright light properly defining out this, this form. The fact that the, the artist allowed the most beautiful piece of this art to get lost in the shadow, I think is a testament to their incredible skill, which I love so much. Check out Darkin and Anthony Jones's artwork and look at how they use smaller shapes to break down large shapes. The use of spider webs here, or the use of dangly stringy bits, all of these bridges to break apart the large forms into smaller forms, but they do so in a very moody, evocative way. Look at that. I mean, I could go on and on. And how this design aesthetic translates directly into the characters themselves. You cannot create a character like this by thinking, I'm gonna create a warrior and he will have armor and the armor will have this design on it and he will have this type of, no. You have to think more objectively. Think about, think about the mood of forms. Think about how they feel. Look around at different things like trees and bridges and weapons and, and plants and try to translate that information in a very objective way into the armor and then turn those shapes into armor after. Okay, and then we get into the third. Dark Souls 3. Now, if you're ever gonna buy this book, I warn you, the seams on these books are not made very well. And this is the second one I got. The first one, the seam broke on it and I bought a new one. So do be aware of the fact, don't try to push the seams of this a little bit too much. Now we get into the third book. And by this point, the Souls genre is very, very well established. But again, what I respect hugely about Miyazaki and his work ethic is that he didn't lose sight of what made his games so beautiful. And like I said, this translates into Sekiro. This translates, of course, into Bloodborne. But I look at this painting, this loose artistic painting, and I can physically place myself in this 
because I've been there. And all of these beautiful details were not squandered. Look at the beauty of the shrine over here. The ash, the, the shrine room, inside the shrine, where they have all of these different thrones designed based on the different gods. And in it is ash. Everything's covered in ash from all of these bodies that have decayed and dried up and washed away. Sad, but beautiful and melancholy. I don't look at this and think horror. I don't look at this and I think scary. And I like scary things. I don't give a crap about scary things. I look at this and I think beauty. I remember watching an interview with, uh, uh, with Del Toro where he was asked why he, he's into horror. And he says, I'm not really into horror. I, I don't see these things as being scary or ugly or gross. I look at them and I see them as being beautiful. And I really strongly agree. As a teacher, every artistic principle that I teach is witnessed in every camera angle, every square inch of every Souls game I've ever played. Now, from an artistic perspective, the overlay of colors and the high contrast might not be the, the most professional way of approaching it, but to me, it's about expression. And it's that expression that inspires me to create artwork. It's not, I don't create art for the sake of creating something that shows off how technically advanced I am. I create artwork because I'm trying to share my feelings with other people. That's the difference between design and art, right? Art is, a, is an emotional expression and that translates into any different kind of, kind of art. And this is art in the game form in ways that most games don't possess. You approach the, the, the deacons and you find you're in this beautiful, huge cathedral, larger than, larger than you could possibly imagine. And the foundation on the second platform is starting to give way and the entire shrine is starting to collapse. So you have this completely tilted shrine right at the viewpoint, right at the center of this huge, huge, huge cathedral that's large enough for giants to walk through the cathedral. And then you walk around this to the back and you, you're brought to this mind-blowingly exquisite room which you wouldn't even notice these beautiful details unless you look up. I make a point when I'm playing any Souls game to always look up and look at what's overhead because it's tempting when you're playing a game to just look ahead of you. You're focusing on the enemies in front of you. But when you look up, you go, oh my God, look at this. And it's a ceiling that's, it's, it's, it's a ceiling. I wouldn't be surprised if this inspired it. That is, that is clustered with hundreds of different shaped incense burners. And the shrine itself has all along the top, it's hard to see, but all of these up here are all different statuettes of different deities, I suppose, or priests. And there's hundreds and hundreds of candles that have all been dripping down for hundreds of years. So it's just draped, almost like bird poop all over a statue. It's just hundreds of years of wax that's dripping down the sides and it's surrounded by the bosses, which is all these priests, these deacons that are walking around with these candles. And you walk into this room and I'm sitting there, I got my ass kicked about 10 times just because I wasn't paying attention to the game. I was just too, I was too hypnotized by the beauty of this location. And it just keeps on going like this, all of these different locations. And this is the kind, like I said, this is the kind of stuff that gets me up in the morning. This is the kind of stuff that pulls me into my most pleasurable artistic place that gets me lost in my artwork. And that doesn't only translate into the into the environment, it translates into the character designs as well. Probably to one of the most beautiful character designs of all time, in my opinion, and that is the dancer. Where design meets movement, where every art form merges together, musically, dance, design, animation, and even battle, even the fighting style. The fact that Miyazaki can integrate this, these many artistic disciplines into a single design and execute it in a way that, that where the gameplay does not suffer on top of it is one of the greatest artistic accomplishments in a video game of all time. And it's a perfect note to end today's book discussion on. If Miyazaki, Miyazaki, if you ever listen to this video, if you ever watch this video or any of the artists that have ever worked on this game, on this entire series and continue to work on this series. You haven't only helped to inspire me, you have helped to define me as an artist. And this is personal, this is from me to you. This is the kind of artwork, it's this artwork that you've created that gives me breath every day and, and feeds my inspiration to create artwork. So to all of you, particularly to Miyazaki, at the helm of this beautiful creation, I owe you a debt of gratitude. 
for what you've created. And I can't wait to see what you come up with next. So to all of you, I hope this has helped to inspire you as well. And of course, I love you all and happy painting. Take care.